As a movie fan and somewhat of a Disney fan, I think arguably the crowning achievement during Walt Disney's life was the movie Mary Poppins, about the magical nanny who takes care of the two Banks children. And one feature about this character is that she never speaks in specifics. She always speaks in doublespeak or metaphors. Even in making the movie, I, under I have heard the story that one song that the Sherman brothers had written for Mary Poppins to sing, Julie Andrews actually asked them to write a different song because the song they had written was too specific to what Mary Poppins was talking about. And so the Sherman brothers sat down and rewrote the song to what we now know as a spoonful of sugar because that is in line with the character and style of Mary Poppins. She doesn't say, make your chores a game and it will be fun. She says, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. She doesn't say, show kindness to those in need. She sings a song about a bird woman who sells bird seed for tuppence a bag. In order to get the children to go to sleep, she does not sing them a lullaby, but rather the song she sings is about how they should stay awake. And of course, it lulls them to sleep. And when on one occasion George Banks comes home to find an entire band of chimney sweeps having taken over the house, dancing their way through the halls and the different rooms, after they clear out, each one of them shaking his hand and wishing him a good evening, he turns in a rage to Mary Poppins and says, could you please explain the meaning of all this? To which she says with all the British dignity she can muster up, I never explain anything. What we hear in today's gospel is something very similar. It says Jesus never teaches the people without parables. And he does not explain those parables to those who listen to him, but rather will do it side and aside and privately with his closest disciples. But even in the context of us reading the gospel itself, very rarely does Jesus explain himself. He might give a bit of a hint at the beginning of some parable, such as on one occasion he says, Jesus told this parable to people who were confident in their own self-righteousness, and then tells the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector. The only time, in fact, he explains the parable is the parable of the sower and the seed, where he gives the parable, and then after a brief discussion with the apostles, he tells them the meaning of each seed. But even then, he is still somewhat ambiguous. What does it mean of the devil taking the seed and flying off with it? What does it mean of the seed sprouting and then withering? What does it mean of the thorns rising up and choking off the growth of the seed? Certain elements of the parable are still left to our interpretation and stimulate our intellect on matters of faith. But never does Jesus explain the parable. And it's very different from, say, a satire or an allegory, like, say, Alice in Wonderland, where scholars can pinpoint which character represents the prime minister, which character represents the queen, Queen Victoria, which character represents parliament and various aspects of Victorian English society. Parables, on the other hand, are meant to stimulate our thought, our reflection, and even our discussion because God made us in his image and likeness. And part of that is he created us with a rational intellect. And in many ways, the parables are very complementary of that because Jesus is not going to spoon feed everything to us. He's going to leave much for us to figure out and reflect in light of the teachings he gives us that are direct. Given that this is the year of St. Joseph, we always like to give a mention to Jesus' father, St. Joseph, I often wonder if many of these parables that Jesus tells us were stories that he heard from his own father growing up. Then Jesus took them to adjust them and tweak them for his own evangelical purposes in presenting the gospel during his ministry. But we see many different types of parables that have a potential for many different types of reflection and many different types of reaction. Some parables can be very, very provocative. Not the least of which one is a very familiar parable to us, which tradition has entitled the Good Samaritan. 
The Bible never actually says Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. It said Jesus told this parable, and our tradition has called it the Good Samaritan. But if we put ourselves back in the society of Jesus to a Jewish person of that time, there was no such thing as a Good Samaritan. The animosity between Samaritans and the Jewish people was very intense. They hated each other. And now Jesus is holding up a Samaritan as the answer to the question, who is my neighbor? Imagine what the reaction must have been, and perhaps even the presumption that the man on the road perhaps would have probably rather died than be helped and be indebted to a Samaritan. It was perhaps the kind of story where parents would decide, maybe we shouldn't let our children hear these stories that Jesus is telling. We're familiar with a parable that is entitled by our tradition, the prodigal son. And there again, the gospel doesn't say Jesus told the story of the prodigal son. Our tradition and scripture scholarship has put the title to that parable. But in asking ourselves, who is the prodigal son? We might say, well, that's obvious. It's the son who left and came back until you look at the setting of the parable itself. Jesus was ex uh, extending fellowship and sharing fellowship with sinners and outcasts, and he was the recipient of the objections to the Pharisees and the scribes who did not approve of him associating with sinners and outcasts. And the Gospel says it is to them that Jesus addressed this parable which might get us thinking perhaps the prodigal son is not the son who left and came back, but the focus of the parable is the son who stayed, was faithful, and vehemently objected to the celebration of his brother's return. We have some parables that are very, very ambiguous, such as the parables we hear today. The parable is like a mustard seed, the parable is like, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet thrown into the sea. The kingdom of heaven is like a lost treasure or a lost coin. The kingdom of heaven is like the lost sheep that the shepherd goes to leave the 99 and search for the one. Some are just ludicrous notions of what Jesus is presenting to the people. And some of them can be very, very tragic tales, leaving us with a feeling of foreboding such as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, a parable that ends with the rich man in the realm of the dead praying for some relief, praying that his brothers be given something to spare them this torment, and all of his requests are denied. Jesus tells us the parables to stimulate our thought to get us thinking about what the meaning is in light of the gospel that he teaches us. Jesus treats us as intellectual people of thought and profound reflection. And a feature of the parables is the fact that in some cases Jesus is not going to spoon feed us anything. He does not want us to be passive recipients of his gospel but people who actively think about it, reflect upon it, and these parables provoke that very thought, reflection, and discussion, just as they provoke homilies and sermons and preaching as we seek to apply these stories to what it means to live a Christian life and as a true follower of Christ. And so let us truly ponder these stories as we hear them over the course of the year, whether it's through the gospel readings of the masses we attend, or the stories we read as we sit down to break open the scriptures and in a very personal way reflect on what we read of the ministry and teaching of Jesus. But in all things, let us recognize something that Jesus recognizes in us. We are made in God's image and likeness. We are not passive recipients of teachings. We don't sit there and have everything spoon-fed to us like little, immature children. Jesus treats us as mature, adult followers. And he teaches us accordingly. And in these parables, 
He provokes that thought, that reflection, that comfort, that controversy, that hopefulness, that foreboding feeling, in order to bring us to a more deeper reflection of the gospel he has given us to learn, to ponder, to reflect, and ultimately to pass on.